<laughs> I don't care that he's the president of the United States and he's 79 billion years old. That fall was funny. It looked like it deserved cartoon sound effects. He's fine. I don't know if you saw, he sprung up faster than inflation. But I will say there were people that were actually there that witnessed the fall in person saying it was way worse. And actually he was wheelie lucky not to be hurt worse. I, this, the show will get better from here. Wheelie lucky setting the bar low today. This is a new show. Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. I got a fantastic Monday show for you today. But first, gotta let you know, you only have a day and a half to get for sure what you want over at beautifulbastard.com. The June drop, of course, hitting you with those emotionally exhausted tie-dyes, the embrace change, goodness, extra comfy. Are you taking care of yourself gear? And to get that, beautifulbastard.com, top link down below. But buckle up, hit that like button to help spread some common sense news coverage, and let's just jump into it. Hey, y'all, first up today in stupid and or batshit crazy news, we should talk about Senate candidate Eric Greitens. He's a Missouri Republican, like I said, running for the Senate, and he's in scandals right now involving a spousal and child abuse accusations from his ex-wife, as well as having accusations against him that he sexually assaulted and blackmailed his former hairdresser while governor, and that being only one of the reasons he ended up resigning back in 2018. And so today, seemingly as a way to try and shed this image of a guy that maybe is violent he ran a new campaign ad. I'm Eric Greitens, Navy SEAL, and today we're going rhino hunting. The rhino feeds on corruption and is marked by the stripes of cowardice. My guy, how is this a real campaign ad and not a fake ad that they put in the Purge franchise? Wait, is it over? Join the MAGA crew, get a rhino hunting permit. There's no bagging limit, no tagging limit, and it doesn't expire until we save our country. And in addition to all the reactions you would expect of what the fuck is this crazy person doing, you had Twitter publicly limiting Greitens posts, saying it violated the Twitter rules about abusive behavior. Facebook also removing the video, saying that it was removed for violating our policies, prohibiting violence and incitement. Vote Vets also chiming in, saying Eric Greitens, a member of the Navy Reserves, has violated DOD policy by identifying himself as a SEAL and using military uniforms without a disclaimer, and calling on others to report him. Like, he is such a ridiculous person, even Republican Senator Hawley has said that he should leave the race. Back in March, saying if you hit a woman or a child, you belong in handcuffs, not the United States Senate. It's time for Eric Greitens to leave this race. But fun fact, right now in the polling, he is in the lead in Missouri. And then let's talk about this Catholic middle school in Worcester, Massachusetts that can no longer be considered Catholic because it displayed a pride flag and a Black Lives Matter flag. Right, so the school in question is the Nativity School, which is for boys in grades five to eight. And back in January of 2021, students reportedly wanted to fly two flags to make the community what they referred to as more just and inclusive. But then in March of this year, Bishop Robert J. McMahon and the Diocese of Worcester told the school to take the flags down, later warning the Nativity School that if it did not do so, it could no longer identify as a Catholic school. And according to a recent decree from McManus, despite my insistence that the school administration remove these flags because of the confusion and the properly theological scandal that they do and can promote, they refuse to do so. This leaves me no other option but to take canonical action. With his decree going on to claim that both flags are symbols that embody agendas that contradict Catholic teaching, arguing that the pride flag represents support of gay marriage and actively living an LGBTQ plus lifestyle, and then saying, while the church stands unequivocally behind the phrase Black Lives Matter and strongly affirms that all lives matter, it believes that the movement has co-opted the phrase and promotes ideas that clash with Catholic social teaching. And so as a result, he says, the school can no longer call itself Catholic, meaning they can no longer be permitted to celebrate mass, sacraments, and other events on campus, nor can it sponsor these events in any other church within the diocese. It also can't take any fundraising involving the diocese and will be removed from its directory. The name of the Bishop Emeritus on its board of trustees must be removed as well. And so in response to this, the president of the Nativity School gave a statement defending the flag saying, the flag simply state that all are welcome at nativity and this value of inclusion is rooted in Catholic teaching. Though any symbol or flag can be co-opted by political groups or organizations, flying our flags is not an endorsement of any organization or ideology. They fly in support of marginalized people. With a parent echoing this message to the Boston Globe saying that the flags are just to make our kids feel comfortable like they are at home. With the outlet noting that the school serves mostly black and brown kids from disadvantaged backgrounds and provides them with a quality free education. And so as far as what happens next, you have the school appealing the decree and according According to the Globe, this matter could actually end up in Rome. So for now, we'll have to wait and see. But of course, with this story, I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then we should talk about how tensions are rising.
rising between the Justice Department and the January 6th committee. The DOJ is asking the panel to provide transcripts of the more than 1,000 interviews the panel conducted, arguing that the lack of information sharing is hurting the agency's own sprawling criminal probe into the insurrection. And in a letter, the department said that the transcripts were relevant both to its overall criminal investigations and ongoing prosecutions, arguing it is critical that the committee give prosecutors copies of the transcripts of all its witness interviews. With the agency going on to argue that it cannot be sure that all relevant evidence is considered in its criminal investigations without the transcripts and adding, the select committee's failure to grant the department access to these transcripts complicates the department's ability to investigate and prosecute those who engaged in criminal conduct in relation to the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And to that point, while the letter pertains to the investigation broadly, it was also included in a filing by federal prosecutors consenting to push a trial for leaders of the Proud Boys militia group until December. And both the defense and prosecution agree that the transcripts are necessary to have before the trial so they can adequately prepare their cases. With the defense lawyers also expressing concern that the documents might be made public in the middle of the trial, which was previously set for August because House investigators said that the transcripts will be released in early September. Right, but understand, this latest request comes as tensions between the committee and the DOJ have been growing for months now. I mean, this isn't even the first time the department has asked for these transcripts. Just last month, Representative Benny Thompson, the chair of the select committee, said that the DOJ had requested the documents for its investigation. But you had Thompson saying the committee would not heed the department's request, saying at the time, my understanding is that they want to have access to our work product, and we told them, no, we're not giving that to anybody. With Thompson also echoing his initial remarks in response to the DOJ's new request, saying, we're in the midst of conducting our hearing. We have a report to do. So we're not going to stop what we're doing to share information that we've gotten so far with the Department of Justice. We will eventually cooperate with them. But also beyond that, the panel has also clashed with the DOJ over differences in the two investigations, with committee members having publicly criticized the agency for being too slow or not aggressive enough in pursuing possible criminal cases against Donald Trump and other high-profile members of his inner circle. We saw those tensions come into focus earlier this month after the DOJ decided it would not prosecute Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and another close aide, Dan Scavino, for contempt of Congress after they defied the committee's subpoenas to testify. And this sticky relationship between the two bodies has also underscored divisions within the panel itself, where the members have made it clear that there is disagreement among them over whether or not to make criminal referrals to the DOJ, with some arguing that the department will step in if it sees fit, while others have expressed skepticism that that would be the case. Right? Because a key thing here is the committee itself does not have the power to bring criminal charges, and so if they don't refer them to the DOJ, and the DOJ doesn't come up with them on its own, it's possible that nothing could happen to hold Trump and others accountable. But for now, we'll have to wait and see, and there is a possibility that we might actually have someone from the panel on the show this week, so uh, I'll let you know more about that as, uh, as I learn about it myself. Then, for your not everything is horrible palate cleansing, today in Awesome Story, we have Mr. Beast, where he's arguably one of the biggest and most successful online creators ever, and he has somehow found the time between making his own Willy Wonka chocolate factory and his own Squid Games and making company after company and telling Ninja he is trash, raised millions of dollars of supplies for Ukrainian refugees. Right, by reaching out to refugee centers in Eastern Europe, Mr. Beast was able to learn what the people there really needed, and he ended up making this long list with Mr. Beast explaining. Medical supplies, food, basic necessities, cleaning supplies, even simple stuff like hygiene that we take for granted. And we managed to coordinate over $3 million worth of goods to give to Ukrainian refugees. With him showing people in his local community helping to not just gather donations, but also pack them up and get them ready to send over. With many, including Ukrainian people, wanting to do what they could from the US. Also getting a number of companies involved, including Disco Beds, giving pallets of beds, MedSource Labs, donating $100,000 in desperately needed medical supplies. And I'll say a really key thing here is it doesn't just end there. But as Mr. Beast even notes in the video, at the start of the war, people were sending so many things to Europe that ports started getting jammed. So you started seeing these delays that were stopping these urgently needed supplies actually getting into the hands that needed them. So for this, he established his own logistical chain to get this batch of supplies over. With him also saying this is only the beginning and that he plans to send millions more in aid to the refugees. And I gotta say, seeing Mr. Beast, seeing Jimmy at the top of the mountain and still doing these things, it's awesome. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, Manscaped.com, the global leader in men's grooming tools and hygiene solutions. You know, when it comes to men's grooming and hygiene, you always want the right tools for the job, and that's where Manscaped comes in. They've created the ultimate men's grooming kit for the modern man, suitable for men who prefer a trim, close shave, or anything in between with a Platinum Package 4.0 by Manscaped. Your bathroom tool shed includes the Lawn Mower 4.0 electric trimmer and the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer. If you're looking for a stronger shower game, the Manscaped Body Wash and two-in-one shampoo and conditioner duo cuts my shower time in half. You can also fight the funk with the new aluminum-free stick deodorant for under your arms and crop preserver for, uh, well, you know, down there. And one of the best things is that all these products are vegan and sulfates and parabens-free. And when you opt into the Peak Hygiene Plan, you can get all your favorite Manscaped product replenishment sent straight to your door hassle-free. Oh yeah, and the freebies, the, the Shed Luxury Travel Bag and a free pair of Manscaped anti-chafing boxer briefs. So simply go to manscaped.com slash today and get 20% off plus free international shipping. That's 20% off 
plus free shipping at manscaped.com slash phil. And then, in huge news. We have big developments in the extradition case of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. The British government has approved the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the U.S. That's right. After 12 years of detention, Julian Assange is staring down life in prison, or at least his options to escape have drastically narrowed. With the U.K.'s Home Secretary Priti Patel approving his extradition to the U.S. Friday morning, rubber stamping an official order made by a London court back in April, marking the most important update in this case since he was evicted from the Ecuadorian embassy back in 2019. Also, to give a definitely oversimplified recap of a super complicated story for those of you who haven't been following this, Assange founded WikiLeaks in 2006 as an outlet that published classified documents leaked by whistleblowers. In 2010, Chelsea Manning came to him with the largest leak of files in U.S. military history known as the Iraq War Logs, exposing that the U.S. lied about not counting civilian deaths and ignored reports of torture, rape, and murder as well as war crimes like the famous video showing the pilots of an Apache helicopter laughing after gunning down several civilians assumed to be insurgents, two of them Reuters journalists. Then in 2012, after the UK Supreme Court ruled that Assange should be extradited to Sweden for a rape allegation, he claimed political asylum in the Ecuadorian embassy, with him saying there that if he is sent to Sweden, then he'll be sent to the United States where the government will persecute him for his work. And so he stayed there, trapped inside the embassy for the next seven years. And while the rape charges were eventually dropped, he remained there out of fear of US authorities. And he was right to be afraid because in 2018, it was revealed that the DOJ had secretly filed criminal charges against him. Then we saw the following year, Ecuador kicking him out of the embassy. I mean, you can literally see him getting dragged out, with him at that time being thrown into Belmarsh Prison and where he is still locked up today. So after two years of house arrest for the rape charges, seven years of political asylum, and three years of maximum security imprisonment, his mental and physical health has dramatically deteriorated. As Nils Melzer, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, explains, I went to visit him with two medical doctors to have an objective basis, a psychiatrist, a forensic expert. We visited him for four hours. We had separate uh, medical examinations and bilateral discussions with me and we all, the three of us, came to the conclusion that he showed clear patterns of psychological torture. And then, obviously, Julian Assange's state of health deteriorated to the point where I was genuinely afraid he might die in prison. And let me put it, make it very straight. Psychological torture is not torture light. Now, with this latest update about Priti Patel's decision, the prospects look very grim for Assange. Right? Because in Britain, the Home Secretary is the final authority in extradition, though Assange does still have a couple of legal paths to pursue. First, he can appeal the case to the British Supreme Court, but many see that as likely to fail since the same court rejected his appeal last March. Second, they can appeal the case to the European Court of Human Rights, which seems more hopeful, but British Justice Secretary Dominic Robb has promised to propose a new Bill of Rights letting the UK ignore the court's rulings. And Boris Johnson's been threatening to pull out of the European Convention of Human Rights entirely because of a ruling it made last week blocking the deportation of some migrants to Rwanda. Plus, each court would have to agree to hear Assange's appeal in the first place, which is not guaranteed. And ultimately, if this happens, if he is extradited to the United States, he will face 175 years behind bars for espionage charges. And so with this, you have WikiLeaks calling this a dark day for press freedom and for British democracy. And all of this comes after weeks of calls for Patel to block the extradition from journalists, politicians, rights groups, and Assange's family, with his wife Stella responding to the news by saying, We're gonna fight this. We're going to use every appeal avenue, and we're going to fight. I'm going to spend every waking hour fighting for Julian until he's free. And his lawyer, Jennifer Robinson, saying, This is the outcome that we have been concerned about for the last decade. This decision is a grave threat to freedom of speech, not just for Julian, but for every journalist and editor and media worker in this country. You also had major creators like Hassan Piker speaking out, saying Assange should be free. Also hitting on reports that the CIA under Trump discussed potentially assassinating Assange. And of course, with this story, there's way more to talk about. So, to get some insight, I reached out to Kevin Gostola, a journalist specializing in whistleblowers and press freedom, who has covered the Assange case from inside the courtroom. With him first explaining just how unprecedented this is in modern American history. Obviously, we've seen in uh, continents like Africa, um, South America, and the Middle East, uh, countries that are much, much, much less uh, free and open that, that, that they do this to journalists. But it's always held up and celebrated that in the West, in, in Western democracies, in, in like UK and the United States, that we won't do this to the press. And they had always set a boundary that... Uh, this law, the Espionage Act from 1917, which is over 100 years old, that uh, they would only use this to target people who leaked information to the press who were violating their oath, uh, allegedly, or the, the agreement that they had signed when they got a security clearance. Throughout history, they had threatened press groups or they had threatened media organizations, they had threatened journalists with prosecution. Uh, they had stopped uh, and, and never gone beyond threatening um, a, a number of journalists and organizations with prosecution. But now, with this case, 
They have claimed the authority to decide who is and is not a journalist. Kevin then talking about some of the more extrajudicial methods the U.S. government used to pressure Assange, which are being examined in a Spanish court. Former CIA director Mike Pompeo um, and another former CIA official were summoned to give testimony and share what they know. Because it was sourced for this Yahoo News report. It got a lot of attention because the headline was in bold and it said uh, that it, it accused uh, Mike Pompeo and the CIA of being involved in developing secret war plans uh, to kidnap or poison or even consider killing Julian Assange outright while he was in the embassy. We get to 20. 17, 2018, and this company called Undercover Global, it's a private security company run by a man named David Morales. He uh, develops this arrangement with which we think uh, goes all the way to the CIA, but there is still some things to be proven before we state that definitively. But we know the CIA had access to audio and video recordings from inside the embassy and they're involved in going after his attorneys, trying to identify Julian Assange's, uh, who, who we know now are his children. He has Stella and his family uh, interested in all his visitors, collecting uh, and putting together files on people. They were going after doctors, collect his medical notes. But one of the things they did that was the most outrageous towards uh, the baby that was coming in, who they suspected was Julian Assange's uh, son, uh, they tried to steal a, a diaper from his uh, it, it, I, his son to do a DNA test to try to confirm whether it was his or not. The fact that they had cameras, they were bugging all parts of the embassy, they bugged the women's bathroom where attorneys were actually already going into to meet because they believed that other parts of the Ecuador embassy what were being snooped on. And so this is all known because of documents that uh, are in the possession of his lawyers. Um, he's got uh, one lawyer named Eator Martinez who represents him in Spain. Uh, and they have all these uh, documents, files they have. There, there's whistleblowers that came forward and passed on information. There's two of them. They're unnamed, we don't know who they are. Uh, they're in fear for their safety, that they could be retaliated against by David Morales, who has a military background. And so with all this, as far as what happens next, you had Kevin saying, Unfortunately for Julian Assange, who's been in prison for over three years now in Belmarsh since being booted and kicked out of the Ecuador embassy, it probably means another year, if not longer, of, uh, of legal battling. Um, and then maybe you know, he does get closer to being put on a plane and brought to the U.S. for trial. And so I thank you again to Kevin for the time. But with all this, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts on any and all aspects of this story? What are you feeling and why? Let me know. But ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. Thank you for watching, like, and being a part of that conversation down below. If you want some more news, I got you covered right here. But with that said, my name is Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you tomorrow.